Good afternoon. Let's turn to Psalm 67 in our Bibles. Psalm 67. So good to see you all again. Very thankful for this opportunity to preach. Small psalm, but as you'll find this morning, this afternoon, excuse me, that there's a lot we can learn from this small psalm. Let's read it together. It says to the chief musician on Neginoth, a psalm or song. God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this psalm that you've given to us that we will study this afternoon. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would show us the application that needs to be made in each of our lives. Father, I can't convey the truth in my own power. I ask for your Holy Spirit to use me in such a way to convey the truth clearly and succinctly. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would have free reign in this session. Help me to be simple and not complicated. In Jesus' name, amen. It was on December 14th, 1799, that our first president, George Washington, passed away. He left an incredible example for future presidents to follow. He would be our, you could say, the benchmark for what a president would and should be. Before he died, he wrote in his will that he wanted to be buried on Mount Vernon, Virginia. You can go there today. You could see his mansion. You could see uh, the property that he owned. He made provisions for a new brick tomb to be built to replace the deteriorating family tomb. It would not be, though, until 1831 that his body and his wife Martha's body would be moved to this new, newly built tomb. You could see this tomb for yourself, where his body rests. You could see at the, uh, the entrance, you go in, you see two sarcophagus, sarcophaguses, one for Washington himself and one for his wife. And to the wall that's in front of you, you'll see John 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And outside of his tomb every day is a wreath ceremony, wreath laying ceremony. People come and respect, pay respects to the father of our country. At the ceremony, what they'll do is uh, a staff member will lead the attendants to the Pledge of Allegiance. Something that I remember uh, in grade school, quoting every single day. And they would quote Washington's prayer for the country and then lay the wreath onto the tripod. Now, here's the prayer that our founding father had. And I believe that if there was ever a time it should be prayed, it should be now. With all the political unrest that we have seen uh, and heard of in the last several months, perhaps a whole year, 
This is what George Washington prayed for our nation. He said, I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have the United States in his holy protection, that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another, for their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field, that's the military, and finally, that he would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without an humble imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Amen. That prayer by Washington, they quote every day at this wreath-laying ceremony at Mount Vernon outside of, the, of his tomb. It's a wonderful prayer. It's as if President Washington looked into the future and he saw 2020, and he knew that there would be civil unrest, that there would be a division, and he prayed this. Well, we find in our psalm a prayer that's looking into the future as well. There would be a time when all the nations of the earth would look to Israel, and through Israel they would know their God and their King and sing to Him. This is the Millennial Kingdom. This is after the second coming of the Messiah, that He would establish an earthly kingdom. We find that in many passages of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. Through this psalm, though this psalm is what a Jew would pray in that future time, I want to say very clearly that this is specifically for Israel, but I do see some lessons that we as the church today, in the church age, we can learn and practice from this prayer. You see, the psalmist is praying a prayer that would come to fruition in the future. It's as if he looked through the portals of time and he saw the Millennial Kingdom. Christians should be thinking about the Kingdom as well. There will come a time when our Savior will rule and reign. And all the nations of the earth will bow to him. We find in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will be nations singing, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. But I want to bring it to today. I want to share with you that Christians are to be praying and living in light of the future kingdom now. We are to be praying and living in light of the future kingdom right now. I entitle my message, A Prayer for the Ages. A Prayer for the Ages. Let's look at the main prayer of this psalm, and it's in verse 1. God, be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us. And I love, in the end of the verse, it says, Selah. Think on that. Very important. The psalmist here is referencing, I believe, a blessing that Aaron, the high priest, was to say every day to the nation of Israel in Numbers, Chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, and this is what it says. The Lord bless thee, and keep thee. 
The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. This was God's a declaration of God's blessing on his people. Now I want to break down this prayer. We find, first of all, the plea for mercy. God be merciful unto us. You see, mercy is not, is not receiving what we do actually deserve. Because of our sin, you and I deserve judgment. Deserve punishment for our sin. You see, sin deserves consequences. Sin deserves consequences. However, we find in the scriptures that it is through his mercy that we find so many blessings in Jesus Christ. We find in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 that according to his mercy he saved us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 it says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. We find in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, it's a great declaration on a few of the attributes of God that he forgives sin. This is while he was on Mount Sinai. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. Mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. We don't only find mercy in salvation, we also find it in our Christian life. We find in the book of James... Chapter 5, verses 11, it says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and ye have seen the end of the Lord, how the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He demonstrates mercy through trials in our life. We find in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, that according to his mercy he begot us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lively hope, a lively expectation of a resurrection that's coming for you and for me. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have bowed the knee to Him, if you've called on Him to forgive your sin, give you eternal life. There is also a plea for blessing. And bless us, verse 1 says. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, we find a list of blessings that God would give to Israel if they obeyed him. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 says that they would have preeminence above all the other nations of the earth. Verse 2, their fields will yield a great harvest. Children would be born. They would find blessing at work while they were planting. And lastly, they would have respect from other nations, according to verse 10. God had really special plans for his chosen people to be preeminent among the other nations of the earth. However, that couldn't happen because of disobedience. Disobedience kept them from being blessed. Now this is a prayer for the future that Israel would be blessed in the future. And I believe that some of these blessings they will experience in the millennial kingdom. Now Christians, you and I, are to ask God for blessing as well. Now... Keep in mind that it's not because of who we are. We do not deserve blessing. You realize you, do, you and I do not deserve blessing at all. It's only out of the goodness and the grace of God that gives us blessing. Jesus spoke of blessings 
that God wants to give to his subjects and his kingdom. If they lived such a life of specific qualifications or um, attributes, they would find great reward in heaven. We find in the beginning of Matthew 5. Spiritual blessings like the spirit of meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The spirit of hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I believe some of these blessings are actually for the millennial kingdom, for Christians. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? I think that means that they will have a greater uh, reign, a greater, uh, you can say, a territory of ruling in the, in the millennial kingdom. The scriptures say that we will reign with him. Some will have more to reign than others. And part of it is because they followed the Sermon on the Mount. They lived the life that Jesus expected of them. But some of these blessings are for today, like hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that they shall be filled. Do you desire to be filled? Do you want God to meet your spiritual need that you know in your heart you're satisfied? All my life long I had panted for a draw from some clear spring that I hope would quench the burning of the thirst that I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood. I now am saved. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does it mean to see God? It means that you can see the evidence of his working and his power resting on your life. It says here, on the pure in heart. Are you pure? What does it mean to be pure? It means to be unmixed, to be undefiled. Now, that could mean a lot of things. It could mean, of course, sexually. We find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that we are to abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Young people, it's important that you keep yourself pure. Let me ask you this question, young person. Wouldn't you want, would you want someone who has kept themselves pure for you? Or would you would rather marry someone who has given themselves to other ladies or other men? Because when he marries you or when she marries you, what else does she have left for you? But when the person that you're seeking God for is pure, it means that they have kept everything for you. Everything. That they're not left, you're not left with the refuse. But they keep everything for you. We're commanded to be pure because our Savior is pure. Are you pure this morning, this, you know, this afternoon, Christian? If you're not, there is an opportunity for you to come clean with God. It's in 1 John 1, 9. It could be things you're looking at the internet. That's not making you pure at all. It's actually impure. 
Are you talking with members of the opposite gender in an off-color way? Or, to put it in no other term, there was a time when you did yield yourself to sexual impurity in the physical sense. Young person, Christian, doesn't matter how old you are, there is an opportunity for you to come clean and be pure in the sight of God again. 1 John 1, 9. Now, purity can also mean that your heart is totally devoted to God. Totally devoted. That there is nothing else that uh, distracts you from your pursuit of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God in His fullness. That they know His blessing and power on their lives. It also says here in verse 1, Cause His face to shine upon us. You will find verses all over the Old Testament that talks about God's face. I love Exodus 33, 11. Listen to what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. That's how close Moses was with God on the mount, on Mount Sinai. 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 11, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. Psalm 13 verse 1, David said, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Psalm 31 verse 16, Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me. For thy mercy's sake. Psalm 34 and verse 16. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Another prayer. Psalm 80 verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Psalm 104 verse 29. Thou hidest thy face they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to dust. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, verse 135. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. We find another one in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin is what keeps the face of God from shining upon us. What is his face? It's, of course, His glory, His Shekinah glory. But it is also referring to His favor and presence. I believe in verse 1 it's referring to His favor and His presence. His favor and His presence. Come back with me to the days of Solomon. After the temple was finished, it was completely finished. Solomon makes a beautiful prayer. He prays a glorious prayer in 2 Chronicles uh, chapters 5 and 6. God's glory and favor was physically manifested in the, through the Shekinah glory. The glory of God entered that beautiful temple and everyone that watched just bowed their faces. It was a magnificent sight. That's the Shekinah glory. There will also be a time in the Millennial Kingdom when God's face, now in this I believe I'm, I'm referring to his, his favor, His favor will shine upon Israel and the Gentile nations will know it too. There's so much in the Old Testament about the Millennial Kingdom. This is what Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3 says. 
Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. This is what it says. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Now, there is a more earlier prophecy, fulfillment of this, when Jesus Christ came to the scene. The Gentile world would watch him and follow him. That's what happened in subsequent years after his resurrection. But let me ask you this question, Christian. Do we not need God's face to shine upon us too? We do. We do. We're we're taught in the scriptures to seek his face, his presence, his favor. This is not meritorious. I'm not talking about you trying to earn brownie points with God. I'm talking about you needing his power for daily life. You and I cannot afford to live a day without his power, his strength. I love 2 Corinthians 3.18. It talks about how as we look into the word of God, that we behold the glory of the Lord and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What does that mean? As the Spirit of God teaches you through His Word, you see the glory of God, you see the truths shine through. And those truths, as you obey them, transform you into the image of Christ, more and more into His image. Now let's look at the motive of the main prayer. That's the main prayer in verse 1, but verse 2 through 6, it gives us the motives. In verse 2, it says that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. In Isaiah 2, it says it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. One day there will be Gentile nations that will look into Israel and look to Israel for law. They will know and want to know of the ways of the Lord. All the nations will see it. What about Christians in 2020? We need God's favor and presence today in our lives for the purpose of His ways being known to others. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge in every place. Verse 4 says that He will judge the people righteously, this is another motive. O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. I want to read another verse. Isaiah 2, verse 4. He shall judge among the nations. That's the Messiah. And shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There is a push today for peace, for world peace, coming together. I see more and more of the nations trying to become as one. And you can see that as nations are starting to make accords with each other or treaties with each other to try and be as one as a way for peace. May I say this? There will not be true peace until Jesus sits on the throne of David. Until he sets up his millennial kingdom, there will be no peace. No peace at all. In fact, I see evidence of war going on too. Everyone is against Israel. Now that's prophesied, that's supposed to, that's, Jesus said that would happen that all the nations would be against Israel. We find in the end times in Revelation that that will happen. But Jesus will establish righteousness and judgment and peace. He will be Prince of Peace. Now, what is the result of this main prayer? The prayer is in verse 1, to be, for God to be merciful unto us, to bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. What's the result? What is supposed to happen? Well, in verses 3 and 5 is the answer. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Twice it gives that verse. As God's favor is made evident upon Israel as the Messiah rules in the Millennial Kingdom, Israel will be praising God. Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Now, this was in many senses prophes uh, fulfilled when Jesus came. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But there will be a time when Jerusalem will be filled with praise. Jeremiah 31 verse 7, For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. What about us Christians in 2020? You know others can rejoice in what God is doing through us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 tells us, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And this is the exhortation that Peter gives us for us Christians in the church age. This is what he says. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims with the reminder that we are just passing through. This is not our final home. He tells us, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest 
among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, they shall see, glorify God in the day of visitation. When God's favor is on us, what should happen is the lost around us see something different. There's something different about this young lady. There's something different about this young man. Or it doesn't have to be young. It could be some of you older believers as well. There's something different. God's face, God's favor made a distinction, makes a distinction between those who are truly walking with him and those who do not know him. In the millennial kingdom, it will make a distinction as well. God's favor will make a distinction between Israel and the Gentile nations. They will see Something's different in Israel. Because their king, their long-awaited king, has come. And he will reign for a thousand years. So. Christian. Are you walking with God's favor on your life? Is there sin that's keeping you from knowing God's favor on your life, God's blessing? I will tell you, honestly, it's not worth holding on to your sin. Your Christian life will continue to be miserable if you do. And you will have to answer to God as to why you lived a carnal life. But you can come to the blood. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What truth. Take advantage of the blood. Jesus wants to clean you, my friend. And you can start walking in God's favor. Lord Jesus, we pray that as your people, we would live distinctly. Lord, we know that one day you will come in the future and your favor will be upon the nation of Israel, but Lord, we can learn today, in 2021, 2021, that your favor can be on us as well. Lord, I pray that we would learn to ask for your favor, ask for your mercy, for your blessing, Lord, that the world would see, that the world may know that you are alive, that you are real, and we can share our faith openly. We can explain to people why we do what we do. Why do we live this way? And may Jesus Christ be glorified in each of our lives, in our witness. Lord, dismiss us all with your blessing. We pray that this week you would use us, each and every one of us, in a special way to minister to someone who is in need. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.